Okay. Pending. Okay, so nice. Working. Okay, fantastic. Um, okay, thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. We have uh, Lena Asensio from uh, the University of Bonn, uh, who will be uh, talking to us uh, a bit about uh, the tidal stability of the Fornax cluster dwarf galaxies in both Newtonian and Milgramian uh, dynamics. Um, Elena, I'll give you uh, a five minute warning when we get close to the end and then we'll have uh, a nice Q&A session. Hopefully. So whenever you are ready, feel free to uh, take it away. Yeah. So hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for the nice introduction. So as Tom was saying, today I'm going to talk about the tidal stability of the four next cluster dwarf galaxies in Newtonian and in Milgramian dynamics. Um, this is a project that was done in collaboration with um, my collaborators, uh, Indrain Albanik, Stefan Miske, uh, Aku Venola, Pavel Krupa, and Hong Sheng. And, well, yeah, I'll get started. <laughs> so, for starters, I'd like to begin the talk talking about dwarf galaxies. Dwarf galaxies are the most abundant type of galaxies in the universe. They are characterized by their low mass. Um, small size and thinness, and depending on which crit criteria we use, uh, they can be classified in various types. For example, if the criteria that we use for classification is their formation or origin, uh, then they can be classified in primordial dwarfs. This is if they formed in the dark matter, in the primordial dark matter halos, I mean, they formed in those wells with secreted matter, or they could be of tidal origin. This is if they formed in the tidal tails that are created in the, in, in, in the, inter, in the interaction of more massive and gas-rich galaxies. So depending on what is their origin, they will also have different properties. For example, if they are primordial and they were created in the potential wells of dark matter halos, we would still expect them to be dark matter dominated and to be distributed spiritually around galaxies and galaxy clusters. On the other hand, if we have that they have a tidal origin, we would expect them to be dark matter free, since the dark matter particles are too fast to be captured by the substructures of the tidal tails. And also they would we would expect them to be very fragile and rare, at least in the Lemocidian paradigm. Uh, so that's if we classify them according to their formation. We can also classify them according to their morphology. In this classification, they we, we would have late type dwarf galaxies, which are those which have an active cell formation. And this includes, for example, the irregular of galaxies and they can also be early type galaxies which still don't have an active star formation and this would include types elliptical and spheroidal galaxies a particularity of spheroidal galaxies is that they have very low stellar mass but very high velocity dispersion so how can this be how can it be that if a galaxy in theory doesn't have enough stellar mass to create a potential well that is deep enough to keep bound substructures which are very fast. How can it be that it is still bound? An hypothesis to this to answer this question would be that these galaxies have actually more mass than we're observing. This is they would have a dark matter halo. If this was the answer, or if this was the case, this would mean that Dwarf galaxies would be, or these dwarf galaxies would be of primordial origin, and they should also be distributed spherically around galaxies and galaxy clusters. Um, but what observations show is that most of these dwarf galaxies are distributed very anisotropically. This is forming planes of satellite galaxies. So yeah, these dwarf galaxies are not spherically distributed. And yet, they have a very high velocity dispersion. Uh, if they are uh, anisotropy distributed, this means that it's more likely that they will have a tidal origin than a primordial origin. 
but then how can we explain this high velocity dispersion if not with dark matter? <laughs> so if we don't use dark matter to explain this, uh, we would only have one option left, which, which is modifying Newtonian dynamics. And this is where Mond or Milgromian dynamics comes in. So in 1993, Milgram proposed a modification of the Newtonian dynamics as a possible alternative to the hidden mass hypothesis. This is in this model, galaxies do not need cold dark matter halos. So what happens in here is that the way we would explain in Mond the discrepancy between the Newtonian gravity or the, the gravity inferred just from baryons and the gravity we observed or we infer from the velocity expression of well, the, the rotation curves, the discrepancy would be explained by a modification to Newtonian gravity in the limit of low accelerations. This is when gravity is smaller than a, uh, a constant A0, which equals 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10 meter, meters per second squared. Therefore, in Mond, uh, galaxy scales at one as 1 over r instead of 1 over r squared, as in Newtonian dynamics. And, well, uh, this, uh, this means that uh, gravity will receive a boost. I mean, gravity in the Newtonian regime will receive a boost when in deep Mont regime. Uh, the way that uh, gravity in Mont and Newtonian gravity are related is through the interpolation function. The way this function works is, uh, let's say that you have a very, very high, very, very strong Newtonian gravity, way, way higher than constant A0. And therefore, you will definitely not be in the limit of low accelerations and your interpolating function will tend to 1. And by multiplying 1 times Gn, you will have that your gravity equals Newtonian gravity, as you would expect. On the other hand, if we actually have that Gn is very, very small, way, way smaller than constant A0, we will have that uh, the interpolating function will tend to the square root of A0 over Gn. And once we multiply this by Gn, we would have that gravity equals this term, which is the gravity in the deep mode regime. Um, there are several ways in which the interpolating function can be written. We have chosen the simple interpolating function as this is the one that seems to better match the observations. So from these equations, maybe you can already already see that in Mont, uh, gravity is nonlinear. This means that when we try to solve the Poisson equation for this uh, for this type of gravity, we're going to get some extra terms or additional terms that we do not see in Newtonian dynamics. And these extra terms will have their own effect in the gravitational field. Um, so a very important consequence of the non-linearity of Mond is the external field effect. What external field effect says is the internal dynamics of an object can be affected by the presence of a uniform external field. An example of what this means is uh, let's say that you have a very large um, galaxy with a very strong gravitational field, and you also have a small dwarf galaxy with a weak gravitational field. Um, when, the, when the dwarf galaxy is close to the big strong gravity galaxy, uh, the gravity field of the big galaxy will dominate over the weak gravitational field of the dwarf galaxy. And this will make the gravitational field of the dwarf galaxy more Newtonian. Like it will, it will make a, it, it will make them lose its mod boost to gravity. Uh, so well, now we have our two hypotheses: uh, Newtonian plus dark matter, which is lambda CDM, or we have mod. We have those options. So how can dwarf galaxies help us test which is the right gravity model? So um, when we have that the dwarf is in isolation, 
both in Mont and in Landesilium, we would have that this dwarf would get a boost to its Newton and gravity in Mont because it will be in the Mont regime and therefore nu will be higher than one and it will have Mondian gravity, so it will receive a boost. And Lambda CDM, the self-gravity of the dwarf will also receive a boost because uh, we would expect it to be surrounded by a dark matter halo and therefore its total mass would be way higher than its stellar mass. And that's that's when the dwarf is isolated, but um, as the dwarf gets closer to, uh, let's say, a big galaxy, like I was saying before, in Mond what happens is that the gravity of the big galaxy starts dominating, dominating over the weak gravity field of the dwarf. This makes it more Newtonian and this makes it lose the boost to gravity that Mond was giving the dwarf before. In Landacidium, nothing changes say, somehow uh, because the dwarf is still going to, to be surrounded by its star matter halo and it's still going to have a very st strong cell gravity. From this, uh, we conclude the dwarf galaxies will be more disturbed by tides in Mond than in Landacidium. So this is our expectation. Um, from theory, say somehow, now we should ask ourselves, but what do dwarf galaxies actually look like? Do they look disturbed or they don't look disturbed? So um, to answer this question, we look at the Fornax Deep Survey Dwarf Galaxy Catalog. So this is a catalog of dwarf galaxies in the Fornax cluster. The Fornax cluster is the second nearest galaxy cluster to us after Vir Virgo, and it contains dwarf galaxies with different masses and different shapes. Um, this catalog uh, contains about uh, 564 dwarf galaxies. Most of them are dwarf ellipticals and dwarf spheroidals, which in this catalog are classified as the same type. Um, this survey was capable of observing very faint dwarf galaxies up to a, a surface brightness of 26 mach r second, which, uh, which is a very good improvement with respect to the previous complete survey catalog, uh, complete survey catalog of the Fornax cluster. Uh, the dwarfs in this catalog are already visually classified by Akubenola in undisturbed, for example this, possibly or mildly disturbed, or very disturbed, well, or unclear. <laughs> Those ones were simply not shown. Uh, in our analysis, uh, we considered that possibly disturbed and very disturbed are simply disturbed to simplify things. And we also remove late dwarf galaxies as they are likely contamination from outside. We remove dwarfs with unclear morphology as they are not giving us any information. Uh, we also remove dwarfs at a protected distance higher than 800 kiloparsecs from the center as these are likely not orbiting the central galaxy. And all this leaves us with a number of dwarfs that is 353, which should still be good enough to perform a reliable analysis. So that's it for the observations. Now we go back to theory. <laughs> and by this I mean that, uh, well, I'm just going to explain briefly that dwarfs in a galaxy cluster environment are going to be affected or this, their shape or anomophology is going to be affected by the processes that are taking place in the cluster. Uh, so some of these effects are, for example, ram pressure stripping, which is like a drag force um, that the dwarf experiences as it's moving in the environment of the cluster and this makes it lose its gas. However, however uh, Venola 2019 pointed out that the gas in the four next dwarfs should have been already been stripped long ago and this is probably not the reason why we would see them disturbed nowadays if we do. 
Another effect is harassment, which is a disruption in the tidal structure due to interactions with massive galaxies. Uh, in the book, Being in Tremaine Galactic Dynamics, this, the disruption time scale is derived. And in this equation, we have that uh, terms with a subindex S, consider this and this, uh, denote the subject, in this case, the dwarf galaxy. And terms with the subindex P, perturber, denote those terms which refer to the perturber or the massive galaxies. In principle, this equation would look quite similar for Lambda CDM and Mont, but there's some important things that we need to take into account in its theory. For example, in Lambda CDM, every time we talk about well, when we talk about mass, we should talk about stellar mass plus dark matter mass. Uh, while in Mont, what we need to correct for is that the Newtonian gravitational constant is not no, it's no longer going to be Newtonian, and some correction needs to be applied for it to account for the Mont gravity. And well, that's for harassment. Another effect would be tidal disruption, which is the disruption in the dwarf structure from the cluster's tidal field. Um, so we can define the tidal radius as the radius at which the self-gravity of the dwarf, which is this term over here, is about the same as the gravitational force of the tides from the cluster, which is represented by this term over here. And from this definition, we can solve for R tide or R tidal, and we get the mathematical description description of what our title should be. Um, once again, uh, th these equations look fairly similar, both in the Lambda CDM and in the Mond case. But also, once again, we need to account for the fact that in, in the case of Lambda CDM, the dwarf should have stellar mass plus dark matter mass. Just to clarify, we're only accounting for the Dark, uh, for, for the dark matter that is enclosed within the optical radius, RH, which is about 4% of the total dark matter halo. And in MOND, once again, we need to account for the fact that G is no longer the Newtonian gravitational constant, but this GF. Another small difference is that um, they are both multiplied by some constant values, which what they are doing is just accounting for the shape of the dwarf as it's getting disrupted by the tides. And just as a side note, um, since the tides, it, well, since the dwarfs are going to be more disturbed by this by the tides at pericenter, we are always going to calculate from now on our tide at pericenter. So having these definitions in mind, our tidal and disruption time scale, we can now define the tidal susceptibility, we can now define tidal susceptibility or eta, as we call it for short. Uh, so we define first tidal susceptibility from harassment. This is from interactions with larger galaxies as the fraction between T4 nux, which is the expected age of the four nux dwarfs, against tidal disruption, which is what we calculated before. So if the tidal disruption is much larger than T4 nux, the age of the dwarfs, its harassment is going to be very small, and the dwarf will not be very affected by harassment. On the other hand, if a T disruption is way, way smaller than T4 nux, its harassment is going to be very high, and the dwarf will be very affected by harassment. Um, that's that's it for harassment. Then we do the next thing, the, the same thing for tidal susceptibility from the cluster tidal field at pericenter, like I said before. So we calculate uh, eta tidal uh, as the fraction of the 
half mass radius, which is the radius containing half of the total luminous mass of an object. And our tidal, which I defined before, is the radius at which the gravitational tide from an external object starts to dominate over the self-gravity of the object. This is when the gravity of the tides starts winning over the self-gravity of the dwarf. So let's imagine that we have a dwarf with a very strong self-gravity, either because it's surrounded by a dark matter hill or because it's a dwarf in the deep Mont regime. So if the dwarf has very strong cell gravity, the R tidal will be very far out. And this means that the tidal susceptibility is going to be very small. This is this dwarf is not going to be very affected by tides. And we have the other scenario, which is that um, the dwarf has very low self gravity either because it doesn't have dark matter and it's Newtonian or because it's a Mondian, a Mondian dwarf dominated by the external field effect. So if G dwarf, the self-gravity of the dwarf is very small, the R title is going to be very close to the dwarf center and this means that if this room is very small, eta tidal is going to be very, uh, very big and this dwarf is going to be very susceptible to tides. To the point where if our tidal is way smaller than half mass radius, the dwarf is going to just be destroyed. <laughs> uh, so with these definitions in mind, what we do next is we calculate the tidal susceptibility in terms of first in terms of harassment for the all the all the dwarfs or the dwarfs that we considered in the Fornax uh, dwarf catalog that we talked about before. Um, so what we do is we construct a histogram first of both Inland City and Manimont of the tidal susceptibility values and the number of galaxies that fall in each beam. So well, we do this for tidal susceptibility from harassment and we do this for tidal susceptibility from the cluster tidal field too. Um, first thing we might observe if we compare these two and these two is that the eta harassment, this is the total susceptibility from harassment, is way smaller in both theories with respect to the tidal susceptibility from the cluster field. Therefore, we conclude that the effect of eta harassment is negligible in both cosmologies with respect to eta tide. Therefore, from now on, when we speak, when we talk about tidal susceptibility, we're going to be talking about tidal susceptibility from the cluster tidal field, because the one from harassment doesn't seem to be very relevant from its low values. Another thing we notice, if we are now comparing Lena CDM and MOND, is that the eta tidal values in Mont are about five times higher than in Lambda CDM. This is actually something that we would expect from what we said before, that Mondian dwarfs are going to be more affected by tides than Lambda CDM dwarfs because of the external field effect. Uh, now, if we want to be more sure that Tides are the actual responsible for the dwarfs being disturbed, or if we want to make sure that tides actually have a relevant role in the in the dwarfs of the Fornax cluster, what we do is we plot the projected distance with of, of all the dwarfs, these all are dwarfs. And we plot the projected distance of the dwarfs with respect to the cluster center and we plot it against the effective radius over R max, where R max is defined as the maximum effective radius at fixed stellar mass for the dwarf to remain detectable, given the uh, limit of the, the limit up to which each survey can observe in terms of surface of surface brightness. Uh, so what we expect is that dwarfs with larger sites at fixed 
mass disease. More diffuse dwarfs are going to be more susceptible to tides, and therefore it's more likely that they get disturbed by tides. So this is maybe, uh, this is probably why, why we are not observing dwarfs very close, uh, but, well, dwarfs which are diffuse, have a la large radius close to the uh, to close to the center. But one could also argue that diffuse dwarfs are harder to detect, and maybe that's why we are not observing them. However, however, it would be like a huge coincidence that the only dwarfs that we are not observing because they are very diffuse are the ones close to the center because we observe diffuse dwarfs once we get away from the center. Therefore, we conclude that the most likely mechanism that is making dwarfs disappear from this region is tides. <laughs> uh, another Another factor that uh, also makes us believe that uh, the tides are being quite relevant in, for the for the dwarfs in the in the Fornax cluster is that um, most of the dwarfs that were classified as disturbed in the in the catalog uh, are at a distance smaller than 500 kiloparsecs from the center. So. Now that we're a little bit more convinced that tides are the main responsibles for making the dwarfs look disturbed, we go back to um, the calculated eta values for the Fornax dwarfs. So uh, what we would be expecting is that Fornax dwarfs with an eta value, this is um, the ratio between the Tidal, uh, half mass radius and tidal radius. Uh, if this is between 0 0.5 and 1, if these two radiuses are about the same, we would expect them that these dwarfs should be tidally disturbed and therefore should be classified as tidally disturbed. Um, so what we actually see when we plot the tidal susceptibility eta against a fraction of disturbed galaxies in Lanocidium is that dwarfs start to be classified as disturbed at eta values which are way, way smaller than what we would expect. And also we no longer see dwarfs which have tidal susceptibilities higher than 0 0.6, which is weird because we have no reasons to believe that dwarfs should be destroyed at tidal susceptibilities which are so small. And what happens when we do the same thing for Mont is that um, we start to see dwarfs classified as disturbed at tidal susceptibilities, which are a bit higher than expected, but still more consistent than Lambda CDM, I would say. <laughs> and but we also see that there are still dwarfs at tidal susceptibilities which are very, very large. I mean, we would expect dwarfs to be destroyed at these very large tidal susceptibilities. So, uh, we, before we get to any conclusions, we also have to take into account that these dwarfs might be affected by projection effects. This means that uh, maybe the distance of the actual distance to the center of the dwarf uh, is, has been miscalculated when translating from a 2D distance to a 3D distance, I mean, from the picture to reality. To account for these projection effects and also to actually quantify the trends disease, where do dwarfs exactly start being disturbed? Where do dwarfs exactly start getting destroyed? What we do to account for all these things is to build a forward model. Building a forward model means that we're going to make a particle simulation imitating the Fornax system of dwarfs. And we're going to try to learn from that <laughs> simulation, as I'm going to explain in a moment. So uh, what we do to set up the simulation is uh, we choose lot of, well, several initial distances or semi major axes, and we choose a lot of eccentricity values, and we 
have agreed with all those values. And then we basically try all possible combinations of distances and eccentricity values. And then what we do with all these possible orbits is we record eta max over the orbit and we use it to assign a disturbed probability, uh, a probability of disturbance or destruction, as I will explain in the next slide. And as I said before, we also want to account for, uh, for possible projection effects. So we consider that the dwarf is being observed under all possible angles. Now that we have all our possible orbits in all possible ways, what we do is we assign probabilities to the orbits. This means that we assume a certain um, radio, uh, radial profile for the orbits in such a way that depending on what is the radial distance from the dwarf to the center, it will be assigned a certain probability given by this equation. A similar thing for the uh, distribution of eccentricities um, the, um, the probability that the, a certain value for the eccentricity of the orbit is the most likely one will be given by this equation. And finally, we also give a certain probability for a dwarf to be disturbed or to be observed disturbed as a function of its tidal susceptibility. So in all these probability functions, as you can see, there are many terms for which I haven't defined a value. This is because since we want our, our model to look as close and as, as similar as possible as the real Fornax system, what we do is we, let, we leave all these parameters as free parameters and we feed them to the observational data uh, using MCMC. So what are these three parameters? Uh, we have first the core radius, which is the radius of constant density of the constant density central region of the Fornax cluster, which is this in logarithm scale. And we also have uh, slope PR, the slope of the red, a, a probability of radial profile, which is the power law slope of the dwarf radial distribution in the cluster outskirts which is given by this uh, formula that I showed before. Uh, same for slope P, which is the slope of the eccentricity probability distribution, given also by the formula that I showed before. We also have the minimum eta disturbance, which is the lowest eta value at which the dwarf is disturbed, as well as eta destruction, which is the opposite the eta value at which the dwarf gets destroyed, the maximum one. Um, this is what, what, sorry, this is what these two parameters uh, are representing. And then we also have a uh, p-disturbed floor, which is the minimum probability for a dwarf to appear disturbed if eta is smaller than minimum eta. For example, uh, if the dwarf is appears disturbed, but this is not because of tides, it's, for example, because uh, the, the dwarf has an asymmetric star formation. Uh, well, we obviously also define a p-disturb ceiling too, which is a probability for a dwarf to be disturbed right before it gets destroyed. And these are the uh, p-disturb ceiling and p-disturb floor that I was talking about. <laughs> so uh, with all these three parameters, we run an MCMC for uh, for trying to match uh, several observational constraints. These observational constraints being the projected distance, the distribution of tidal susceptibility, and the disturbed fraction against tidal susceptibility. Um, well, these are, these are the best fit models that we obtain with the MCMC method, both for the CDM and for MOND. And what we actually see is that the algorithm managed to uh, match pretty well the observed properties. 
but uh, it managed to do this for a very different parameter values, especially in the case of tidal susceptibility. <coughs> As you can see, um, in the in the Lena CDM case, the the eta values are always smaller than the eta values preferred by the Mont case, as it was to be expected from all the tests that we did before. Uh, so good thing about the, M the MCMC is that it not only gives you the best fit value, but also it gives you the uncertainties or uh, the confidence region of values in which you would expect your parameter to be. And this is uh, basically what this triangular plot is showing. The, this is a triangular plot for the um, one sigma contour level of all parameters and, uh, and all possible combination of parameters that we run in the in the MCMC. Among all these panels, I would like to focus especially on this one, which is showing the minimum eta disturbance against the eta destruction of the dwarfs in Lena CDM, orange and in want in blue. As we were saying before, we would expect dwarfs to be either destroyed or very affected by tides once their tidal radius is about the same as their half mass radius. This is when eta is about one. <laughs> so as you can see, Mont more or less does manage to match this expectation, uh, but Lambda CDM is actually very far away from matching the expectation. And also just to clarify for uh, obtaining these control levels, we impose the prior on the MCMC that eta destruction must be higher than minimum eta distance to get physically realistic values. And this is what this gray region is representing. What we didn't impose a prior for is um, is that P disturbance sibling uh, must be higher than P disturbance floor. The reason why we didn't impose um, a prior on, on this is because we wanted to do a null test or we wanted to check whether the algorithm managed to identify that the higher your tidal susceptibility to the cluster tides, the higher should be the probability of the dwarf to be disturbed. Like, yeah, we, we wanted to see if the algorithm managed to identify that there was a rising trend between these two things. And what we saw is that in pretty much, I mean, most of the cases, the algorithm managed to realize that P disturbance link must be higher than P disturbance floor, according to observations. And this is just a further test to check that uh, uh, tides from the cluster center are actually a mechanism that is making the dwarfs look more disturbed. So um, that's uh, that's all for the um, for the forward model. Like we were saying, in Mond, it seems to be much. It seems to be working a little bit better because it's closer to one. In the CDM, not so well because it's not so close to one. But then you might also be asking, how are you so sure that eta equals one is a reasonable? It's a reasonable stability threshold. So this might intuitively make sense, but it is true that in the real dwarfs, there are many things going on that cannot be well represented by a point mass particle. And therefore, to make sure that eta1 is the actual stability threshold, what we do is, and we perform in body simulations in MOND, uh, first in MOND, uh, for checking the actual tail stability limit. So the way we set up these simulations is we set up a central potential in galaxy 
and we initialize a dwarf with certain mass and health mass reduce properties and we give it a certain orbit at, a, at an initial initial reduce uh, and initial eccentricity. So in this example that I'm showing, um, maybe you can see that the dwarf is getting completely destroyed. It starts as a very compact uh, it's a, as a very compact uh, point and just gets destroyed. This is because I chose purposefully for this example a very high eccentricity that is also making the dwarf have a very high tidal susceptibility at pericenter. Wait, sorry, of 2.5 exactly. And what we actually want to know is what is the eta pericenter at which the dwarf starts looking this disturbed or it starts looking disturbed and that way we will know what is the actual eta stability threshold to find out about this we perform like a lot more simulations for several eccentricity values that will give us several tidal susceptibility values at pericenter and um, from these simulations we plot the several properties of the dwarf, like for example, its distance to the center, its aspect ratio, its velocity dispersion, and its half mass radius. So what we see, for example, in the half mass radius case is that when the tidal susceptibility is kind of small, like 0 0.7, 0 0.9, um, the behavior of the dwarf is adiabatic like it gets a bit perturbed uh, when close to pericenter, when close to pericenter because of the external field effect. But once it goes back to being isolated, it recovers its initial properties. What happens when the eta, uh, eta susceptibility is actually quite high, like 1.5 or 2.5? What happens is that the dwarf gets close to pericenter, gets very disturbed, but afterwards it, ha it is not able to go back to its initial uh, properties because it's no longer bound or equivalently it has been destroyed. And this is something that we see for pretty much all the properties of the dwarf. They, di they diverge and they don't go back to what they were to what they were in the case in which the dwarf has been destroyed. And like I was saying before, our aim is to find at which eta does this happen. And what we found is that eta destruction is actually 1.5, which is rather close to one, which was our expectation. So this is for this is for Mond. What happens in Lens CDM? In Lens CDM, we didn't do the simulations ourselves because there was already other people who had done this years ago. Um, what they found is, for example, in the Peña Rubia 2009 paper, a, is that only systems in orbits where the tidal radius, where the tidal radius is defined as tidal radius that we defined before, is comparable to or smaller than the luminous radius of the dwarf. A, this means that only, only dwarfs that have a tidal radius about the same as its half mass radius. This means eta tidal sensitivity one are going to be affected by tides. Uh, therefore, we would expect eta destruction for the CDM to be about one if we are conservative. And going back to our previous analysis, what we find is that in MOND, the eta destruction of 1.5 is inside the one sigma expected region, but lambda CDM is still very far away from its expected uh, eta destruction from, uh, from actual in body simulations. And this is something that we plotted for the contour plots and also for the just data destruction. Easter realms, which may be also easier to see. Um, so yeah, I'm just that's basically the conclusion of the project that Mon seems to work 
rather well and rather and way better than a uh, landa cdm when describing the morphology of the dwarfs observed in the fornax cluster uh but well to go to the conclusions and to summarize this in a more general way we conclude that uh, well observations of the fornax dwarf morphologies tell us that some of us are disturbed we know also that the disturbed fraction is higher towards the center and also that there's a tidal edge, there, there's a tidal edge <laughs> and that diffuse dwarfs increase as we move away from the center. Um, so from this, we infer that the main process expected to disturb the dwarfs is cluster tides. And our initial expectation is that eta, which is half mass radius over our tidal, is about one. In Landacidium, for next dwarfs should not be tidally disturbed ac according to this criteria. But observations imply that they are disturbed, and this requires a tidal stability limit of eta destruction about 0.26 to match the observations. Um, this means that in Landacidium, dwarfs should be, dis should be disturbed when the uh, tidal force is only 0 0.6 is 0 0.26 to the cube uh, times the internal gravity this is when the tidal force is way 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 smaller than the internal gravity which it doesn't make much sense <laughs> uh, that's for lambda cdm for mont what we see is that four next dwarfs are expected to be disturbed because eta is higher in this model due to, due to the external field effect and lack of cold dark matter. And the required stability limit, uh, stability limit is eta destruction of 2.17 with some errors. And this is actually in agreement what, with what we obtain with in body simulations, that is that eta destruction should be about 1.5. So those are all the conclusions and all the results that I wanted to present. That's all. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elena. That was uh, a nice talk and very well explained uh, for <laughs> a non-expert such as myself. Um, um, it's clear. <laughs> So we uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand um, in Teams. And for for people in room two two two, uh, I guess raise your hand in person, and Camila will will uh, raise the hand on Teams so we can all all see it. Um, while we uh, wait for for people to give some some time for for thinking about questions. Um, I was curious about a plot back on slide, I'm going to say 14, I think it was, um, if I remember correctly. There was some some points on there which had quite considerable error bars, and I was wondering what the main contributors to these these uh, large uncertainties. Yeah, this, oh, oh back yeah, one. Sorry, this one. Uh, yeah, the, the error bars yeah. are, um, are uh, well, drawn in terms of how many dwarfs we observe in each bin. Mm -hmm. So if uh, there are not some, for example, in the case of Landa CDM, there are barely any dwarfs that are in the bin from 0 0.5 to 0 0.6. Um, therefore, we say, okay, that the fraction of disturbed galaxies should be around this, but there's a lot of, of uncertainty, of uncertainty because we barely have data in this bin to make a reliable assessment in this aspect. So so yeah the the bars are the error bars are drawn in terms of how many dwarfs do we have in, in each bin. The, the, the more dwarfs we have the more reliable we consider the data point. Yeah okay okay that's what that's what I thought but I just wanted to to clarify. So when mm -hmm. then like going to fainter um, or lower surface brightness dwarfs uh, in, in future observing surveys, you think that will help with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, of course it it, it will help, uh, but also uh, 
I don't really think that it will change the results so much because, uh, like we show in the plot in here, we already saw that uh, well, this uh, this survey was already quite good in terms of observing um, faint or diffuse or diffuse dwarfs. And in that sense, I don't really expect the results to change because the main the main reason why we're not observing dwarfs is because of tides, not because observational limits, I would say. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, of course, it will help to have more data. That always helps. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. Um, Keith. Yes, hi, uh, great talk. Very nice. Thanks. Um, I wanted to go back to one of the points you made at the beginning, which was that in Lambda CDM paradigm, you expected the dwarf galaxies to be spherically distributed around. around yeah, I guess their, it's fine, yeah. their host. <laughs> so if, if I remember talking to some colleagues, the, the Lambda CDM people say that in fact, you observe these planes of satellites because they're coming in on filaments that are displaced slightly, and so they tend to arrive with angular momentum that's aligned. Do, it, does it this? Uh, do you reject that uh, explanation as as not not uh, valid for explaining those planes of satellites? Mm, so, yeah. Uh... In regarding this explanation, this was considered in Pavlovsky, I can recall the year, but it, it was in one of the Pavlovsky reviews. It considered this possibility and it performed the simulation to see if, if this hypothesis worked. And the conclusion it got is that, uh, yes, because it's uh, the, the dark matter is being formed in filaments, it's not as isotropically as we would expect, but still it's it's not enough to explain the satellite planes. Like the, the, the anisotropy that we are observing is very high to be explained uh, by this hypothesis. I mean, the hypothesis helps, but doesn't really solve the problem. OK, so you're saying it goes in the right direction, but there, it's just not enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, from from what Pavlovsky was saying, it's, it's it still was in tension with observations. OK, thank you. Uh, Indrana? Uh, yeah, so um, I just want to mention um, that's uh, correct. Uh, there was a detailed study by Pawlowski uh, and collaborators in 2014, but there was mm. also another study by uh, Shao uh, from the Durham group in 2017, which came to similar conclusions, and it explicitly stated in the abstract that um, a group in fall sort of scenarios can't um, work. Uh, one thing I would mention is that filamentary accretion is already self-consistently included in lambda CDM cosmological simulations. And uh, it's in those simulations that the satellite planes in the local group and around Centaurus A are unlikely. So um, this process is kind of already included. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, do we have any more questions for Elena? We have a, a minute left, so if you have a quick one. OK, a quick one. OK, go ahead, Camilo. Can you hear us? Can you hear Hong Cheng? Hi. Can you hear? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, between, okay. but yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, so the destruction time scale um, normally is uh, treated as sort of the mean of uh, uh, exponential distribution, say. And so if you look at your uh, the fraction of um, perturber, uh, perturbed versus uh, the, what is it, the susceptibility parameter, you normally expect a, a one minus exponential uh, shape. Sorry, I, I can't hear you so well. Which part of the uh, referring to? The susceptibility dis uh, distribution plot with error bars. Okay. The um, one that we just discussed. Yeah, this one. Okay. <laughs> so normally you expect susceptibility. So uh, it's not like a susceptibility uniquely 
uh, corresponds to a distraction or not, but it's a, it's a probability, it's a mean of a probability. So you should get a one minus exponential. So the linear and then get the exponential like. Uh, that would be what you expect. So you can fit that to find the actual susceptibility. No, but, but maybe not for this data, but I'm just saying that normally it's uh, that uh, for, for even at the same susceptibility. What do you think is it's going to be a distribution rather than a unique. What you are saying is that we should have expected to have probability distribution for this plot. Like a probability distribution of the total accessibility against fraction of these galaxies. Yeah, but you are you already making this uh, distribution as a probability. Yeah, but what's the what's the conclusion on the point five? Uh, on the point five uh, susceptibility that there, this is reversal, reversal of so not terribly significant, but it's there. There's a reversal that more susceptible things uh, actually are less disturbed for the CDM. Mm -hmm. The blue, the blue points at mm -hmm. point yeah. five. There is a reversal. I'm not sure what you mean by reversal in this context. <laughs> that it's more susceptible, but the fraction is uh, uh, actually dropped. Mm -hmm. It's more susceptible, but the fraction has dropped. It's OK. Well, can... so, sorry, I, I don't really understand the question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Maybe maybe I have phrased it incorrectly, but well, I can discuss it later on. OK, we can discuss it later if you like. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think we've gone over the hour now uh, and people uh, have meetings. So, uh, Indra, I don't know if, if your your hand is for this comment or but um, maybe this could also yes, be to answer th this briefly. So um, first of all, the uh, reversal Hongxing was pointing out. Uh, this is not really statistically significant. The error bar is very large on the data point between 0.5 and 0.6 for Lambda CDM. Um, and secondly, I agree in general that the uh, fraction of disturbed galaxies should sort of uh, saturate at some value. Uh, right? In general, it should sort of rise. Uh, the fraction of disturbed galaxies should rise with the tidal susceptibility. Um, and in, if you're wondering why it doesn't reach one, it's because even if a dwarf is almost destroyed, so very disturbed, uh, there is still a chance that observers would, for various reasons, not notice that. So, for example, it's very elongated along the line of sight. Um, so uh, that might be why the title says why the, why the fracture of disturbed galaxies doesn't reach one. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answers some of uh, the questions on Hongxing raised. That sounds very like a very uh, as an observer. That sounds like a very reasonable um, interpretation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, OK, uh, so thank you all for, for joining us this week. And of course, thanks uh, to Elena once again for for walking us through your work. And <laughs> no, thanks nice. for having me. Uh, you're, you're all welcome. Um, so I hope everyone can join us uh, next week when we have our very own Nicholas Boardman talking uh, about, about his research. Um, so until then, uh, see you all later. <laughs>